Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Social isolation is a significant factor that leads to aloneness in people's lives. Long before COVID-19 was even named, aloneness was already a global pandemic. While loneliness is described as a state of solitude or being alone, aloneness is a state of being. The current crisis we face is an opportunity to address the human crisis and disease of aloneness. Everyone struggles, everyone has a story, but we hide it because it's embarrassing to admit we don't have it all together. We conceal our private pain and fake it to fit in. Our next guest tells the story of aloneness and untangles the many lies and messiness of life that has entrapped people for ages. You can discover your identity, be the person God intended, and help others know they matter. There's a simple cure for our human crisis. Pain doesn't have to be permanent, and loneliness does not have to last forever. Timothy Eldred is a seasoned pastor, author, keynote speaker, and unrelenting voice for the next generation with a reputation for challenging the status quo. He speaks and teaches throughout the world, and his books have been read by hundreds of thousands of people. He lives with his family in Central Michigan. You can sign up for Tim's free resources. It's all about relationships at Timothy Eldred, E L D R E D, dot com. And follow on him on social media at Timothy Eldred. Joining us now to talk about his new book, Alone Sucks, is Tim Eldred. Tim, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Well, so good to be here, Eric. First of all, thanks for calling me Tim once you got past the introduction because. If it's Timothy, then it means I'm in trouble with you or you're my mother, one of the two. Well, I, I looked up your middle name so that I could actually address you as Timothy and, and, and act like your mother, but I couldn't find your middle name. Uh, and I'm not telling. I'm not telling. Right. So, uh, <laughs> you know, all of us remember uh, that, that, that call. Um, my middle name is not a middle name I'm very happy with, but it's one that I've I've uh, had to live with for almost 69 years, and the name is Elmer. And if you can imagine growing up in the 50s uh, with the name, middle name Elmer, uh, Elmer Fudd, uh, just not a great name, but that was my deceased father's middle name. And in Judaism, we don't name for the living, we name for the dead as a living memorial. So he always wanted, he actually wanted my first name to be Elmer, and that was probably the only battle my mother ever won against him, was don't saddle this kid with that name. Uh, it might have been fine coming from the old country, but it's not okay in this country. And so my father being a first generation American, uh, or, or I was a first generation American, he was an immigrant, uh, um, yielded to her not to call me Elmer, even though he wanted uh, that to be my name. So. Uh, I heard uh, the same way most of us do. When your full name is spoken, you know well, you that, know. that that's, that's, that's right. it. Uh, life as you know it is about to either end or radically change. <laughs> Let's go back to that time in your life. Uh, and I always like to take this journey backwards. Uh, yeah. The words of Paul always ring true in my mind, and that is, not that I've accomplished all this, but this I do, forgetting what's behind, I press on to the prize that waits for me in the high calling of Messiah. However, we then read all the narrative that says we're overcomers by the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So we've got to reach back to our roots, to our beginnings, to see the framework so when we reach this age, we can look back, harvest the nuggets, and begin to realize how Romans 8.28 really is a retroactive application of God's Word, that all things worked together for good, uh, as well as a future promise that all things will work together for good for those who love Him and call it according to His purpose. So take us back, did they call you Timmy? Yeah, Timmy, I still get called. Timmy, Tammy. I remember a pastor friend of my dad's always called me Tammy. Never really did like that guy. So, no. But it was Tim, you know, all the time. And uh, seldom, I don't think I actually, actually got Timothy, Richard. Um, but I can remember my mother 
gritting those teeth, and I knew when my mom grit her teeth that, uh, you know, I'd I'd crossed the line. And the youngest of four, I mean, I had, you know, a pretty good chance that my brothers were going to get blamed for something long before my name got called. But, you know, I was actually a leftover as well, so six years behind the rest of them, I had plenty of opportunity to, um, you know, have my name shouted long after my brothers had left the house and um, for good reason you know my dad always says a little tongue-in-cheek probably 100 percent tongue-in-cheek he says you know we didn't know if we were going to let him live past the age of 16 and if other people didn't think i would actually live to make it to 16 with some of the choices i had made growing up as the youngest of four and a pastor's kid and a child who moved a lot and my dad was a pastor and a church planter and so um, I was always moving 18 homes by the time I was 18, and every time you move someplace, you're starting over. And when you start over, you're trying to discover your identity. How do you fit? You know, do you fit? And what am I going to have to do to fit? So that's a big part of my story that, like Paul, I, I, I don't want to forget, you know, and I don't think he's telling us to literally forget, like block it, bury it, dig a hole, and cover it up. You know, but don't live in it. Just don't, you know, forget it. Remember the pit from which you've been dug, right? Because that's important, because it's our story. And our story is how we connect. I mean, that's all God's Word is. It's a book of stories. I mean, it's more than that. But at the end of the day, it's a book of stories that we can relate to about people learning to relate to God in the midst of all the craziness of their lives. So it's important to remember. You know, having family as being the stable connection, brothers, mother, father, the uprooting of a child 18 times in 18 years is a breeding ground for alone. It's a breeding ground for rebranding. It's a breeding ground for uh, entertaining uh, who will I be in this next iteration? Who will I present myself to be? What mask will I wear? Uh, this didn't work at the last school, so when I go to the new school and they ask me who I am, what, what am I going to say? Who am I going to present myself as? Can I, is this 18 opportunities to recreate me in order to be acceptable and to find acceptance within this new world, what mask in my closet, not just of short pants and t-shirts, but my Batman sliding door uh, that says, here's all the masks I'm gonna wear. Who am I gonna be because who am I? That's the, that's the big question, isn't it? I mean, it's 18 colors of chameleon. Now I say I'm the, I'm the greatest chameleon you'll, you'll ever meet. And even though you may change your identity, you know, and put on a different mask and present yourself, one thing became true and rang true no matter what I presented to people is that I didn't know who I was. It, it took me years I mean, I still, you know, to be honest, and sometimes that's the struggle of being honest because it creates this vulnerability. And, you know, we, we run from vulnerability because vulnerability will get you, you know, uh, will get you fired. And, um, and one of many you know, outcomes of just sharing and being open and honest, and yet that's the way we connect through that, through that story. One thing I discovered is that, you know, when you don't know who you are, it really doesn't matter what outfit you put on that day. Because um, people see through that. They begin to see through that. And um, no one really likes fake. No one really likes a phony. Or, you know, somebody pretends and uses. <clears throat> Did you find... So you do whatever it's next to, you know, attract a crowd and, and find that acceptance. Did you find yourself in this... Surrounded by family... Uh, obviously in church all the time, Dad was the pastor, you were required to go, uh, you were required to connect, there was a facade that you had to put on as the pastor's kid, 
Uh, you were to look right, act right, talk right, do right. Everybody was looking, and they were looking 18 different times throughout all these moves and these various congregations that you were a part of. Uh, that in itself is a setup for incredible uh, disassociation, incredible isolation, incredible sense of alone. Yep. Is there a distinct difference between being alone and loneliness? Uh, is, there the, is there the emotion of loneliness or the feeling uh, in that soulish part of us of not belonging and not fitting in that then manifests itself that we realize that we have become isolated and in that isolation because we don't have connections and connections just like a lamp. Uh, a lamp is a lamp is a lamp. All right? it can put, you can put a new bulb in the lamp <clears throat> you can set it right in the middle of the room but if you don't plug it in, it yields no light. It's no less of a lamp. The bulb is not defective. But unless you're connected, it has no power. It has no source. Did you find yourself in this disassociated, disconnected kind of world that <clears throat> was all a part of this process to get you to write this story because it is a story that is told from an empathetic perspective, not from a theological, not from a um, academic, but it's more from the cry of the heart that says, I feel your pain. I know your pain. I, I've been there and it is painful. And we're now creating a culture which will be uh, painful. Uh, many of the maladies of humanity today, anxiety, suicide, uh, deep depression, uh, sleep disorders, all these things are tied up into this disconnected. We're all lamps. We're called to be a light to the world, but yet it's been dimmed. It's been replaced with with something of a lower wattage than what God has equipped us for. Was this a part of your struggle and how to be a light and everything that was out there seemed more attractive because it was different, it was new, it was a different set of people, different set of influences and that had some allure to you to try to connect. This is the gang on the street. This is what the the street culture offers you is that, hey, home is broken. You, that's not your connection or your family. Come join us and you're going to join a different kind of family. We're not blood relatives, but we are relatives in a mission. Good, bad, indifferent, whatever it is. We see gangs. We see the rise of Islam because they present it as a family. We used to present Christianity as the family of faith, but we're not the family of faith. We do more to alienate and more to... Um, uh, well, we talk about this personal relationship with Christ, right? As opposed to a familial relationship with Christ, one in Christ. And so our language begins to create alienation. It's a hard topic, and you broached it real quick. So let me go back to that. but first to this issue of one thing you'd asked is the difference between loneliness and alone. I didn't know that there was a difference between aloneness and loneliness until I began to really research the topic years ago. And the book began as a theological academic expression of this struggle. And I was just a few weeks before publishing date and I sat in my office and I felt the Lord nudging and saying, this is not what I asked you to write. I want you to write the story I allowed you to live, that I brought you through. And so I told my wife that I'm going to unpack um, my you know, experience. And she's like, you can't do that. People will crucify you for that. If you are that 
honest and open and authentic, you know, you're going to get hammered for it, which ironically, I never have, at least not that I'm aware of, because again, I think people are looking for that connection. So it really did become a story of empathy. It wasn't one of sympathy, right? Sympathy is, oh, notice me, give me attention for it. The, the story of Alone Sucks is, regardless of its 18 times in 18 different locations and different congregations and communities and churches or homes or whatever it might be, it doesn't, I mean, because that sounds extreme, right? It doesn't have to be extreme because there are people sitting in a marriage, in a relationship, in an office complex or cubicle or a congregational pew or chair that completely surrounded by others feel like this sense of, do I matter? And so we're longing for that idea of, do I matter? Do I make a difference? Am I significant? And so as you're looking for your significance, and we're created for significance. I mean, we're designed to do, not watch. We are... We are created to create or called to create, not called to called to spectate. And so I find that my life doesn't necessarily feel like I, I have any real significance or making a difference or it doesn't matter that I ever lived here. While your light not might be shining, what you do, what I did, was I found a way for other people to shine the spotlight on my on me. And so it draws attention. So instead of being a light, you know, and, and making people notice in a positive way, I made decisions, and we all make decisions to get other people to notice. Like, first of all, people's opinions of us really are no business of ours. I mean, it doesn't matter what you think of me. But most of our life, from our childhood on, and in, I mean, you watch it today on social media where it's exacerbated, People are just saying the same thing. Notice me, like me, share me. And we trying to we're trying to create and craft people's opinion of us in a way that it's false. It's it's artificial. And really, and in the faith community too, as you alluded to, more so than people, especially in leadership, we want to admit, and it's not just the pastor's kid, it's just the Christian congregation in general, uh, we create a very difficult place for people to be open and honest and vulnerable to, I mean, why don't we listen to the words of James where he says, confess your sins to one another? No, 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 can't can't do that. And yet the therapy, and the, I mean, it's cathartic. And so we begin to heal when we can empathize and share and own one another's story. And I think there's a significant difference then when I'm lonely. Like I travel, you know, a, a, a third of my year every 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 year. And so I spend a lot of times alone in like an airport, in a hotel. And that's lonely. I miss my wife. I miss my sons. My sons move away from our home. I miss my sons. Okay, that's different than inside, where it's even hard to express. There's this pit that says, I, I don't even think that what I do has any meaning. I'm not sure I have any meaning. And so, because no one's expressing it. No, no one's no one's going out of their way to let you know. And, 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 and I'm sorry, but be, knowing who you are is not something you're born with. It's bestowed upon you in relationship by others. I mean, we have a, a relational God who Im imparts our identity to us. We're just waiting for someone else to do that. And he knew from the beginning of time that his opinion of us, while it is like cherished son or daughter of the Most High God, born with these birthrights through Jesus that can't be taken away, was not enough. Again, the relationship with God is not enough. He's the one who said so in the very beginning. When he said it's not good for the man to be alone. And the question is, have we ignored that revelation, the first revelation of God to mankind and humankind, since the time he iterated it to us? You know, it's an interesting 
dichotomy because God establishes clearly that uh, it's not good for the man to be alone. We see that man's perversion of that caused us to embrace um, sordid connections that we masked or mirrored um, companionship or co acts of comfort as filling in that aloneness because we had companionship. Whether or not it was in idol worship, it was sexual immorality, it was in uh, sins of the flesh, alcoholism, uh, so, so many different things. Then Paul comes along and um, uh, we don't know a lot about Paul's married life, or, uh, but we do know his message that says if you can be alone, and he's talking about unmarried. He's talking about not being cleaved to someone and becoming one, if you can endure that. And he was really implying that if you can live without the sex, <clears throat> then endeavor to do so. Um, we don't see Daniel, uh, who uh, we believe might have been neutered, might have been made a eunuch, or we, we, we wrestle with that, but we do see the eunuchs. Uh, but we don't see much of a character study of the eunuch lifestyle to see whether or not it was fulfilling, whether you know, there was the fellowship of eunuchs, the fraternity of the Elks Club of eunuchs, the, uh, the, the, you know, the Order of the Moose. Uh, we don't know how it was that they were gathered together in, in community. Uh, but what we see is there's this message that comes along that says that if you can be alone, and he's talking about alone with the Lord. This is where this, this bedrock foundation comes from is that in the natural, <clears throat> God's saying it's not good to be alone. And we've made that synonymous with marriage and for this reason a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and they will become one. But then you come to faith in the Lord and the admonition is for you to become one with the Lord. And that the hierarchy of this in the order of God's economy is him first, then your spouse if there is one. So there is a higher order of connection. There is a higher order of, of filling this aloneness. And it became in the person of Jesus and in the presence of the Holy Spirit that now occupies uh, a place within me in, uh, in the spiritual realm, but in the soul center, which is where my contrary nature resides. That's where my battle goes on between my flesh. Mind, will, and emotions is where I struggle with this. I don't struggle with it in the spirit the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Either I am infilled with it, it's indwelt in me, or it's not. My personal relationship, my spiritual relationship, and my belief in God the Father, uh, in a relationship with the Messiah, and in the presence, the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit within me, equips me to fight these battles. And they are now a part of me. They are not external to me, therefore, they are not external. I don't have an external relationship with God. I don't have an external relationship with Messiah. I don't have an external relationship with the Holy Spirit. I have an internal relationship, which gives me the compounding of one, which is a magnificent number in the Bible because it's reflected in Hebrew terms as echad. Uh, this is a compound unity. It's singular, like a bunch of grapes. One bunch, many parts. Okay? Still a singular bunch of grapes, a family. One family, many parts. And when we look at the intentionality of God in creating this compound relationship, multidimensional, multifaceted, then it reshapes and refines our relationship with God and then with man. I've often looked at the cross 
and imprinted on the cross the numbers one through 10, the 10 commandments. And oddly enough, every time I do it, one, two, and three sit above the cross piece. Four sits on the cross piece, five through 10 below the cross piece. And you ask yourself the question, well, what does that all mean? Well, the first three secure our relationship with God. There shall be no other gods before me. Uh, do not create yourself any idols or graven images. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Then you have the Sabbath rest, which is both vertical and horizontal. I can't maintain my relationship with God unless I invest time in Him and have relationship with Him. And I cannot get along with you if I don't get a break from you. If I don't have time with the Lord and I don't have a Sabbath rest from you and from all the cacophony of sounds and all the competing agendas, then what happens below the cross piece, starting in the middle of the cross piece, is now my horizontal relationship with man. Everything below the cross is, has to do with how I get along with you. That ministry of reconciliation, how do I live this life? Because if salvation was the end all and be all of our experience, once I said yes to the Lord, I'm gone. But we don't get gone, we get stayed. We get assigned with a ministry of reconciliation, an ambassadorship in Messiah. We are to be the voice of reconciliation, the voice where to love our neighbor as ourself, or to do all these things which will address not living a life alone, but living a life set apart. Whoa, so I can be set apart and not lonely? I can be set apart and not alone. I'm supposed to have friendship with the world as hatred towards God, so I can't be a friend of the world. So I'm now in this struggle for identity and relationship, and yet I have a pattern and I have a roadmap. I mean, it's a very, the cross is a very clear roadmap to me as a Jew. I, I got to plot it all out and say, where does all this fall? And that's where it fell for me. I've got to maintain that that Sabbath relationship with God, to honor God, and I gotta get that rest from you in order to be able to do all those things below the cross, which means I'm not gonna bring offense against you. So the struggle for identity is wrapped up in our definition of are we alone, are we lonely, are we set apart, are we called, do we have purpose, and is our purpose defined by God or by human relationship. And I think we've been, as the old country song, western song says, we've been looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, Adam had, I love the analogy and the way that you describe the Ten Commandments on the cross. That's going to stick with me for a long time, and I want to look closer at that. Adam had that relationship with God alone in the garden with him, just Adam and and when he says it's not good to be alone and he creates companionship, which is so much more than the marriage relationship. And companionship brings encouragement, accountability, and support, and everything that we all need. Because it's so much more than marriage. Except this the time we ever use that text is when we, you know, wedding, kiss, we have cake, and then we look at it and what the depth of that is really about. But if a relationship with God alone was enough, the question I always have is, then why is it just still God and Adam in the garden? So it's one plus one. I mean, the highest above the horizontal bar is our relationship with the Lord. Then everything else goes below that. So what we do now is we try to replace and replenish um, and fill our lives with all these earthly relationships with with without the relationship with Christ, let alone you know, completely ignoring the need for Shabbat. Right? And so in Habit Sabbath, not as a not as a weekly, but as a, like every seven breaths, every seven steps, every seven thought kind of lifestyle. And so we have all these self-help books on like picking yourself up, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do it. You don't need anybody else or how to have these great relationships. 
So the issue of aloneness is that God, yes, absolutely, in Christ, I do not feel alone. And now I had this conversation just about two weeks ago on my patio with a friend. And they said, you know, in Christ, I've never felt alone. And I said, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm going to call you out on that. I think that's what you've been taught to say. I think that's what the worship songs you sing are all about. And so you have to go ahead and, like, pretend as a pastoral leader that you've got it all together. I said, but you are telling me in leadership, you're telling me that in life, you're telling me that in love, that you've never felt this sense of aloneness. And his response basically, you know, validates the, the reality that that's how I've been trained to say it. That's what I have to acknowledge. I can't pretend that I've got it all together just because I have an intimate relationship with Christ. I mean, isolation. It's one thing to alienate yourself or set yourself apart, and one thing to go spend time in solitude like Jesus did. But isolation, again, is this sense of being. And most people are isolating themselves. And in the midst of doing it, they get so desperate and lost they don't even know how to nurture this relationship with God to fill in and be the core or the foundation, as you say, of their life. And everything else supplements that. But you have to have, we have to have both. And until we can get that relationship with the Lord correct, which I don't know if we get it correct, Eric, I think, you know, it's constantly evolving and he's constantly affirming to us who we are in him. But how does that anything below the horizontal line work? So we're working at nurturing all of these carnal needs, and they're, they're still needs. Let's not, you know, when, when Paul says, you, know, you can be alone, be alone, he is not in any way negating Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. He's not saying, you know, you don't need relationship. I mean, like you say, he's just really talking about the intimacy, the sexuality, that whole relationship, but I mean, go back to this oneness that we, you communicated. I mean, that's the church. That's the church, one body, many parts. That's the family, right? I mean, he only instituted to ordain two institutions, the family and the church, and both of those are what? One body, many parts. That's cohesion. That's connection. And um, you, you, and, and you can't have the church apart from Christ. You can't have the family as a healthy institution apart from Christ. And yet our culture, and our Christian culture as well, which is sad to say, are trying to create all kinds of connections divorced from the divine. Amen. And we, we wonder why as a culture we're falling <clears throat> apart. It's not new. I mean, I find it, and I would love to hear your perspective on this, you know, from a rabbinical point of view and a Jewish point of view especially, that when God says it's not good, okay, that's, first of all, right off the bat, that's that's very intriguing that God recognizes something he created wasn't ideal. That happens prior to the fall of human beings. So something precedes sin that God reveals to us and for me, that is a prolific point to pause, consider. If it's so important for God to articulate it and record it, for us to understand it before humankind chose by God's design, because he gave us choice, before the fall occurred, then how significant is that text for us to go back and really unpack? And why don't we? Why do we ignore it? I'm going to read something to you before we go to break. I'm going to let you digest it. Um, there was a season in my life when I went through an incredibly uh, devastating betrayal. And I felt that um, I was as alone as I could be. And I found a recording of a psalm, and I played it over maybe a hundred times a day. I played it 
from the time I left my home to the time I reached the sanctuary. I played it from the time I left the sanctuary to the time I reached home. I did this for months on end. I'm going to read it to you. It's written by King David. Man after own God, God's own heart. And he said, How long will you forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take count? Counsel on my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him. I'm sorry. <clears throat> my uh, scroller is scrolling faster than I can. I get that all the time. How long shall my enemy be exalted over be exalted over me? Look and answer me, O Lord my God, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your loving kindness, my my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This was his lament. How long, O oh Lord, will you be silent? Mm -hmm. I think we consider silence and God not answering as being a negative experience. But while we're in this despair, this sense of aloneness, it finally occurs to you who it is you're crying out to. It's not your neighbor. It's not your friend. You're crying out to God and saying, God, I want you to answer me. People are telling me things all the time. I want you to answer me because I trust in your unfailing love and you have been good to me and you will be good to me. We're talking with Tim Eldred author of Alone Sucks, God's Cure for Our Human Crisis. A human crisis birthed in the garden when God said, it is not good, lo tov, not good for the man to be alone. He brought him Eve, but that was not the end all and be all of this journey for if that was the case, all of us would have this Helpmate, all of us would have this this chosen by God uh, connection, but yet, if we were to follow that path of saying that that's the answer is connecting with one another, then God would be removing Himself from the equation, and God was the author of the equation, saying that this is going to bring you together so that the trappings of the world. You will not suffer with alone so that you can maintain and build on your relationship with me. I will give you a pathway that will not be an impedance to your relationship with me. Now, if you can have that relationship on your own, God bless you and that's wonderful. I have that. I'm alone, but I'm not lonely. And I have this permanent, eternal, 24-hour day, seven day a week presence of God in my life and in our ministry that brings me tremendous comfort and allows me to comfort others to be there for them in their time of need. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to dig a little bit further into what this current situation that has us so isolated, what we can do proactively to Renew, restore, refresh our relationship with God, and by doing so, open up avenues of ministry opportunity and connection points to be able to not only reconnect with people in our lives, even though we're separated, but also grant them a pathway, a messenger, that this becomes your ministry, this becomes your way of feeling like you are a part of something bigger than yourself. And when you are part of something bigger than yourself, you are no longer alone and you no longer feel that loneliness that's been filled for you by the love 
in the permanent presence of God. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and my special featured guests twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black, and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Canaan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Hello and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Tim Eldred, author of Alone Sucks, God's Cure for Our Human Crisis. Tim, welcome back to the program. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Tim, we had a uh, uh, rather deep discussion, uh, and those are where I thrive, there's where, that's where I live, is digging into deep biblical truth. Uh, but there is always um, a practical aspect in the, applica the application of faith, uh, faith applied, faith at work. Uh, we read that in Timothy, faith without works. You know, how do we apply these principles? And people are desperate for answers. They're looking for things to do. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, in, in the book looking after yourself and, and practicing social closeness and practical, pra practice mindfulness and plan home activities. Uh, there's some real meat to this that puts you on a spiritual path but allows you to be refreshed enough to embrace and to enjoy. Um, I'm outdoors every day. I didn't used to be outdoors every day, but now I'm outdoors every day, five miles a day, and I chose to use this as a time to tune up this old guy's body and refresh, renew, and restore as I began to look at the um, uh, three score and ten that God had promised me. Uh, will I make it to 94 like my mother who plays golf twice a week? Uh, I need to do some things to make changes, and I did that. And so this was a great opportunity to focus a little bit more on me, uh, which allows me more capacity to pour out to others. How do you approach it in the book, and what are some of the 
truisms, wisdoms that we can apply to connecting in a disconnected scenario? It's funny, Eric, because we've never had more ways to connect in the world, right, than we do today. And yet we're probably the most disconnected generation, even though that, you know, we can sit here through um, Skype technology and phone technology and radio and TV and internet, you, you name it. Uh, I can text, you know, I can, I can, on my phone, I can track where my, my children are across the world as they travel. And yet, you know, I can sit in, uh, having coffee this morning with my wife and make her feel alone because that same technology or tool that I can use to connect, I'm using it to alienate her as I am checking email, answering messages. And so there's a, there's a balance here that it's gonna, it takes, just like you said during this COVID situation, you made a decision, right? Life's about choices. Choices have consequences. Consequences produce chaos. We haven't taught people how to make good decisions about healthy, wholehearted living, about taking care of yourself, let alone then moving on to taking care of others. It seems to be in some for some people one or the other. They're all about everybody else to the point of burning themselves out and not worrying about self-care or all about self with little regard for others where do we find the balance and we haven't even mentioned in there our spiritual connection our relationship with our creator yet the piece that i really focused my attention on because in my reams of research and uh, you know my continuing ed which continues to continue and continue on this topic um failed to mention what I think is the most biblical balanced approach to removing aloneness is that I mean the, the whole idea of, first of all love your neighbor as self well okay that begs the question is when do we actually choose to love self to take care of self to um, have that balance because I can only pass on what I'm filled with right so I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, and then neighbor as self. What we typically do is we put self last. Relationship with, with, with God has to come first. And then I've got to actually, from that confidence and connection with Christ, um, I, I, I find this sense of wholeness and health in, in my own life, physically, mentally, emotionally, and pass that on. And so... As I was coming to the end of writing the final chapter of the book, realizing that I don't know how I'm going to say this in a way that is make people not just go, I read 160 pages for that one last sentence. If you want to remove your aloneness, you have to remove the aloneness of others, period. So how do you do that? How do you get into somebody's hell or somebody's hole with them because unless you can get in someone's hole today they can't feel whole tomorrow right w-h-o-l-e but you've got to be at a point where you're healthy enough to help somebody out of their struggle and when you are get to the point and some people can't do that all right so it it's it, it's not always in my mind it's not always a recipe like one plus one plus one sometimes these come out of order Sometimes people are in such a poor place themselves, they can't even begin to think about being healthy. My recommendation and my counsel to them is, okay, well, while we, you and I are working on something, even if they never re recognize it, you gotta find somebody else who is honestly worse off than you. And all you have to do is open your eyes, open your phone, open your computer, jump on social media for 30 seconds. You're gonna find someone screaming for help. Help them. If nothing else, listen. Just pay attention. It's the idea of do for others as you want them to do for you. What do you want? What do most people want? To be noticed. 
to notice them, get in their get in their hole with them, walk them through, share your story. Because the simple mathematic equation of it is when you and I are together, neither one of us are alone. Now, again, that doesn't remove the issue of proximity. I can be alone and be next to you in a, you know, in a car. When we're emotionally connected, not just physically connected, but especially mostly connected, that's where loneliness begins to erode. So as we're looking at this COVID situation, which is not going away, you know, and for for many reasons, we all estimate that it's either here, it's going to hang on, or we're going to continue to make it hang on. But regardless, we can't control that. There's going to be another COVID, whatever you want to call that. There's going to be another crisis that forces us into isolation. I mean, it's been going on since the beginning of time. This is just one more example of that. But what a great opportunity! I mean, as a friend of mine told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, I hate to say it, but COVID is a gift for you because your book has never been more apropos for what we're dealing with. So how do we help people? Yeah, get outside, go for a walk, take care of yourself. But as you are doing it, as you are on your way, as you are going, it's kind of like the idea of the Great Commission. While you are going, make disciples. While you are going, notice notice stop i mean i've never probably in 30 years of professional ministry had three months where i've had the ability to slow down as much as i have right now and i've had to force myself and it's uncomfortable and it's awkward because we're so used to going so fast so there's a lot of deliberate decisions right now for your listeners and viewers to consider like Am I taking time to take care of myself? And am I taking care of myself in such a way that allows me to actually notice and take care of others? And who do I know that's in a hole? And, and it might be you. And you're hoping somebody would get in your hole with you. Okay. Don't wait for that. We're always waiting for someone else to fix our problem. And while it'd be really nice to think someone could help me. I mean, we live in a world where everyone's like, hey, bail me out, pay my bills, take care of me feed me, whatever it might be. It's time for us to practice what Jesus said. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. So find a place to serve. Find someone to serve. And you'll recognize that by removing their loneliness, you remove your loneliness too. Jesus came to bring a message <clears throat> to tear down the walls of division between divided humanity, and that was Jew and Gentile. There are only two people in the Bible. Uh, all these movements are trying to fragment people into separate boxes, that's the old Greek way. But the middle wall of partition has been torn down, and now mm -hmm. we are one, Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah. Had God wanted to make ethnos a big part of the work of, of the Lord, he would have made ethnos important, but he didn't. It was Jew and Gentile. That's all there was. Two people of the world. And he tore yeah. down the wall of division and made us one in Messiah. We have the greatest bonding, the greatest connection point, and for 2,000 years we have allowed <clears throat> differences to divide us into... 38,000 denominations. It's absurd. And we have done this through man's meddling with God's plan. Your book is a clarion call to go back to the intentionality of God's statement in the Garden of Eden that it is not good for a man to be alone. And here are the ways that you can connect not only vertically but horizontally. And once you grasp the weight of connection and how important it is, you too can have the peer review groups. You too can have the confidants. You can have the safe people in your life. Jesus had 12, and look, one betrayed him. It's not a perfect solution. We're human. However, it's a whole lot better than the alternative of being isolated, alone, 
and with absolutely no prospects and no hope. This is a clarion call to grab a hold of what God has grabbed a hold of you, was that we have something greater than our nationality, greater than our place of origin, greater than where we live today to connect us. We are bound by a shared faith in Jesus, and that is unbreakable, it is inseparable, and it makes us a part of a family that if we choose to be a part of it, we can be. The first step has already been taken. You don't have to take the first step. It's been taken for you. You just need to grab a hold of the one who grabbed a hold for you. I have mm. a friend, Peter Rosenberger, that says, all you have to do is take your scared hand and put it in his scarred hand, and you'll feel the connection, and you'll never be alone again. Tim Eldred, author of Alone Sucks, God's Cure for Our Human Crisis. This is an answer. In fact, it's the answer for what is keeping you locked in that house, being dis feeling disconnected. There are practical ways, but you have to first grab a hold of why God said it's not good for you to be alone, and then to work your way through it. And Tim gives you the tools to do so. Tim Eldred, what a pleasure, what an honor, and what a blessing to have you on the program today. Thank you pleasure is mine. Thank you, Eric. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs> 